All right. Hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is June 9th, 2024. We are counting down the days. We got a little over 60 days left to the highest watch day in all of human history. Yes, we are watching and praying every moment of every day, diligently seeking, searching him out, drawing in closer. We know the reward of being in his presence is at hand, and we will continue to seek and search until that day comes. And brothers and sisters, this is the year like no other. All we got to do is watch some of these recent videos, study them out, and you will all see for yourselves. It's an exciting time like no other in history. And, you know, the you'll notice that I, I, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm a day later than I usually am on videos. And one of the reasons is we've had some pretty heavy videos here, you know, three hours essentially in all of the last at least four videos. And I know some people have been falling behind. I do videos usually every five days. And so for one, I thought I'd give an extra day. And I don't believe today's teaching will go uh, as far as they normally do. We'll, we'll go as long as they normally do. We're going to have some fun, though. We're going to be in the Gospels. And today's video is going to be based on going into a piece of Scripture that I was led to by a sister. And I apologize. I can't remember the, the sister who it was because it was I had I caught something, but I set it aside because it, it was in relation to what she had had me asked to go look into for the um, uh, 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 the mustard seed. So the differences of the story of the mustard seed in the Synoptic Gospels of Luke, Mark, and Matthew. And so I caught something, but not directly related to the mustard seed. It was something that was after it. And so what I found in it was wild. But then I thought, Okay, I wasn't sure what I was going to be doing for today's video yet. And so I thought, well, I, I wanted to do something shorter. You know, I prayed and just spirit lead me because I just I don't know where I should be going, what direction I should go into today, where you want me to seek and search. And I was going through all of my tabs here. As you guys know, we, we'll be starting way over here today. So we're just covering this and things within it that it leads to. But I was all the way back here and I was looking at some of my tabs. And I saw that little, the three or four tabs that I had opened for the mustard seed and what I had found. And so I decided to go in and look. Well, lo and behold, you know, that's how the spirit always leads it. Because I go in and I start reviewing the, the mustard seed story. But then I start going to what the scriptures in Luke, Mark and Matthew are telling us before the story of the mustard seed and what they're telling us after the story of the mustard seed and it is so awesome guys how many times does it have to line up how about every time how about hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of times from the beginning of genesis to the end of revelation we've said it before now let me show you just one little example you guys will remember this when you go to the story for example this is this is kind of what you're going to recognize today. You're going to clearly see it that in the story of the triumphal entry, we've shown how the story of the triumphal entry in Luke, Mark and Matthew is a picture of the Lord coming after the pre-trip for 40 days of the Son of Man is reference to Luke in Mark. It's the end of six years of seals in Matthew. It's the end of the sixth year of trumpets. And what do we see in the story? Not only as we've shared about the differences within the story, but it's about what is written on the entirety of the page within all three of the Synoptic Gospels. And what do we find in Luke's? Luke's is the only one where the story of the triumphal entry, where in Luke's it's a prophetic picture of the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man. We know now who the stones are that would be crying out. But what does he do? He weeps over Jerusalem, right? Because they did not know the time of their visitation. So they're blinded and he's warning them that they're about to be compassed about and they're going to be destroyed. We know that this is exactly connected 
to Luke chapter 21 when the Son of Man is going to be here for 40 days after the pre-trib and the wedding takes place in heaven. He's coming back on the eighth day and he's going to warn as Jonah did. Well, it just so happens after we revealed, you know, probably a few years ago now, the fact that the, the triumphal entry is a typology of his just after pre and then mid and then post comings, we were able to then show that the events that sometimes that come before the timing and that come after are directly related to the events taking place. It happens so often, and that's what's going to happen today. You're going to see this exact same type of thing take place when we go into it from Luke, Mark, and Matthew. And then I'm going to go to the piece that caught my attention within the story of it and why we see certain wording in Mar in Luke and in Matthew, but not in Luke, uh, sorry, in Luke and in, in Matthew, but not in Mark, but then it's going to get deeper because it's going to reference us to the Old Testament. And what you're going to see, man, oh man, again, how many times do we have to show it? But what you're going to see is in relation to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's awesome. And what it tells us, what it tells us as to why it's in Luke and why it's in Matthew, why it doesn't have to be in Mark. All right? So we'll get going into this. It's going to be a lot of fun, exciting. It won't be a super long teaching like the recent ones have. But check this out. Did you guys notice anything? So these have been my little thumbnails that I've been doing, thinking I've been, I've been so creative in how I'm able to do it. I'm not very creative, right? <laughs> so look at our brother Jimmy. Thank you all, uh, Jimmy, our brother Jimmy, who does all of our website and maintains these things for us, uh, was able to get his laptop, so thank you all for the support. And he's now got things turning on the website again where, where the videos are getting posted, and he started making thumbnails for me. He started sending them, I think, today, maybe yesterday. And his thumbnails are much more up to date in the in the modern look of how things were, are looking out there than mine certainly have been. So, you know, mine did the trick, but his are much more uh, of the, the way they are nowadays. So he takes whatever images and the things that I have and the wording that I had, and he just makes the thumbnails uh, much more modern. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Brother Jimmy. And... Um, on the playlist, when we go to the playlist, um, you're you're not going to see it yet because I haven't changed them, but I believe he has sent them to me. The pictures that are going to be on the playlist now, the thumbnails, they're going to be different. So they're going to be updated. They're going to look more fresh, more more uh, to the times, just so you guys are aware. And I think he's even doing it with a few others down here as well. So just so you're aware, we're going to have nice new thumbnails, and hopefully those will uh, help get people's attention as well. So thank you again, Jimmy. And as always, for anybody that's new, you guys know this like the back of your hand, but it's never going to stop until we go. This is it right here. For anybody that's new to the ministry or newer and hasn't yet come to watch our intro series, it, it's a must because you're going to hear things as you start studying through these things that you're going to hear things like who the Gospels are speaking to. You're going to hear things like the tribulation isn't seven years, but it's 14 years. And in fact, there's a little portion called above, which equals 50 days. But you've all heard and, and learned that everything was seven years in tribulation and everybody goes to teach from the gospel of Matthew. Well, you're about to understand for the first time ever, if, you, if you're new here, why we have three synoptic gospels and it is going to blow your mind. If you have ever wondered why do stories in the Gospels sound the same, seem to be the same event, but yet sometimes are very differently described? Well, even whether they're very different, differently subscribed, uh, uh, described or whether there's just slight differences in wordings and so forth, it's all prophecy and it is all because it is speaking to different groups of people at different times in the prophetic future of the is to come. The was is from creation to Christ. The is is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib. And the is to come is from the pre-trib until it's done. To begin to understand these things, come to the playlist link right here on YouTube. And this one right here, the Revealed End Time Study Note Series, 
watch the first four videos. I promise you with all of my heart, it'll be worth every moment of your time. If you've ever questioned or had questions about prophecy, things that were confusing, which all of us have had, or, or you've wondered why there's these differences in the Gospels. How, did the tri how is the tribulation going to fit into seven years with everything that's going on? You are going to begin to understand these things here. So you can come here on YouTube, or you can go right here. Click on ministryrevealed.com. It'll bring up the website, ministryrevealed.com. This is the homepage. You can scroll down and see some of the videos and so forth here as well. But to go to that intro series, click on the intro right here. The other thing you'll often hear me share about is the forum. So a lot of people, we've got over 1,200 people in the forum from around the world, brothers and sisters, just seeking and searching and sharing and prayer requests and Bible studies and questions and all sorts of things. Uh, all like-minded brothers and sisters watching and sharing waiting on the lord all right and so you can come and join us click on the forum take about five ten seconds to sign up and it's free you can come and join us in there the other thing is you can click on the intro right here this intro will bring you to the same first four videos as the playlist did but then the videos after they they'll, they'll be similar but not all of them will be the same and they won't be all in the same order except for the first four this is the first one like I said, the uh, the images will change, so don't worry about the, the thumbnails. This one is a 22-minute intro into the next three videos that will follow. You'll begin to get a little sense. They'll touch on some little things to give you an understanding of what you're about to see in the next three. Videos, you can just, if you wanted to download the video to one of your devices, simply one-click download, and you're good to go. Sometimes we've got study notes with them. You can just one-click download the study notes as well. So this one here is the second video, and it's who the Gospels are speaking to. This one is just a 30-minute Bible study of some of these most uh, straightforward, easy-to-understand differences within the Gospels. For example, Jesus in Luke's Gospel was, was arrayed in a gorgeous robe, which means white, radiant, beautiful. <clears throat> this was before going to the cross in Luke's Gospel. In Mark's gospel, he was arrayed in purple, and in Matthew's gospel, he was arrayed in scarlet. You know, most people, when we've asked, including dozens of pastors, hadn't even realized Mark was purple and, and uh, Luke's was gorgeous. So gorgeous means white, radiant, beautiful, like, like, a, like a bridal gown, all right? And most never even noticed it. But when you notice it, you have to say, well, what on earth is going on? What, what is the purpose of describing these three different colors in relation to what Jesus was arrayed in going to the, before going to the cross? The answer is a gorgeous, white, beautiful robe is what a bride wears. So guess what? The first will be last. The last will be first. So Matthew, Mark, Luke. In the end, it goes Luke, Mark, Matthew. So what's the purpose and what does it mean? You'll begin to understand as we continue. In Luke, as a gorgeous, white, radiant, beautiful robe, that's a picture of the pre-trib bride. There is no gorgeous white robe in tribulation. In Mark's gospel, being purple, and in Matthew, him being arrayed in scarlet, what are the two colors of the woman riding the beast? She's arrayed in purple and scarlet. That means Mark's portion and Matthew's portion are both accounted to tribulation. Which means, as you'll begin to understand who the Gospels are speaking to, Luke, you will come to see, is speaking to the pre-trib bride of Christ. Mark is speaking to the mid-trib world, right? The, the house of Israel, the, the Gentiles that are grafted in with them. And Matthew is speaking to Judah. Once this starts to sink in and you start to recognize these differences, you will then realize that the tribulation and what scripture reveals isn't seven years, but actually 14 years and a little portion called above. Why? Well, you will understand that Luke, that Mark's discourse is the seven years of seals and Matthew's discourse is the seven years of trumpets. And the reason the entire world has only understood the seven years of tribulation 
is because everybody has what? Studied from the Gospel of Matthew. So they've only seen 7,000 years. They only see seven years of tribulation. They've missed more than half the story. That's why everybody teaches you from Matthew 24, Matthew 24, Matthew 24. You go read Matthew 24. There is nothing pre-trib in Matthew 24. It's post-trib. Because Matthew is speaking to the Jews, to the house of Judah, which most of the church knows, but because they never really understood who Mark and who Luke were speaking to, they just continued to teach everybody from the Gospel of Matthew and went a little bit to Mark and even less to Luke to try to fill in some blanks of details of things that have already happened. But the revelation of the is to come is Luke is pre, Mark is mid, and Matthew is post. Ever wonder why people can argue and debate their position on pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib from Scripture? They can all do it with Scripture. The answer is because pre, mid, and post are all true. The pre-trib Luke Gentile Bride of Christ happens, this is a great one to follow to go discover this and understand it better, the pre-trib Bride of Christ goes at the beginning, right before the 50 days in the above portion before the 14 years. The mid-trib great multitude rapture of Revelation chapter 7 happens in the midst of the seventh year of seals in tribulation. And the post-trib return of the Lord feet down on the Mount of Olives happens at the beginning, at the end of 13 years, at the start of the 14th year of tribulation. And that 14th year of tribulation is as it was in the days of Noah from Matthew chapter 24. And when it's over, it's the final jubilee, the end of it all, and the beginning of the millennial reign. I promise you, if you guys will take the time to watch this intro, this 30-minute Bible study on the differences of the Gospels, this 30-minute Bible study on the revelation of the 14 years, and then this one, a big one, two hours and 45 minutes, this one will blow your mind once you begin to understand the other three. Because you will see that it's all because of Matthew that we haven't understood the rest of prophecy. It's crazy. And all this was purposed to be revealed in the final generation. So get ready, because you're the final generation. This one is a three-hour differences in the Gospels. This one reveals the discourses in order from Luke, then Mark, then Matthew. You can see pre-mid post in the triumphal entry in the transfiguration, and in the resurrection stories of Luke, Mark, and Matthew. They are all prophetic typologies in all three of them. The coming tribulation, that's the book of Revelation, like you've probably never seen. The mystery of the seven churches revealed. The, there's a typology of the was. There's the is of, of how they're playing out over the last 2,000 years. And we reveal the understanding of how the seven churches play out in the final 50 days and 14 years of the end of days. In fact, I'll probably be doing a new video on this in the next little bit, um, just even going into greater, greater detail that we've been able to uncover and add to the details uh, since we've done this one. Uh, Mystery of the Comma And is awesome, open books, and then this one. This one is the last one on this page. It's all a fractal. It'll blow your mind. This will take you all the way back to the beginning of the creations to the very end of days and the end of the millennial reign. It's wild. It is so wild, but definitely don't start there. All right? So, with that, sip of coffee. With that, let's get this party started. So, what we're going to do is we're going to start. So, this is how... I went about, okay? This is, I came to this right here. So for those that don't know, this is called blueletterbible.org. It's free. It's a free website online. And you can come and see all of the differences within the Gospels, okay? And where they share the same stories and so forth. And so it's a way to go in 
and say, okay, we know it's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, knowing as you will come to know, or if you've been here for a while, knowing that there are these differences, maybe I can take one of these stories and go see if I can understand where are these differences? What is this difference telling us? And how does it relate to the end of days? You might find some little nooks and crannies. You can share it in the forum. People might comment on it here and there. You know, some people might have to take time and dig into it first. Or you can send me an email or send me a private message in the forum as well. And when I have the chance, I go in and have a look. And sometimes it's just a leading and I just go look into these things right away. So again, for me though, personally, it's just time permitting. And so this was one of those things that I did. I thought, okay, let's go look at the grain of mustard, okay? We can see that it's in Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 13. We know, just like Scripture says, the first will be last, the last will be first. You find out that Matthew, Mark, and Luke of the Synoptic Gospels in the end of days will play out Luke, Mark, Matthew. And the reason John stands on his own I didn't make this up. I didn't call them the Synoptic Gospels. I didn't say John stands on his own. These were things that have been around for, I don't know, several, several decades, maybe a couple centuries or more. I have no idea why they did it, why they called them that. But I could prove prophetically why. And John stands on his, on his own for an absolutely incredible reason as well. So let's start with going into Luke chapter 13. And what I did... As I said, when we go into the story, <clears throat> excuse me, of the mustard seed, we end up seeing there's like a couple verses. So in Luke's, there really wasn't all that much. And so as I was in it, I started to recognize a couple things. There were recent things that we've talked about. There were other things that we've talked about this on before. And so there have been pieces here and pieces there that we've taught on throughout these chapters in the past in variations of other videos and other teachings. You guys will remember even the leaven, right? Because the leaven here isn't a bad leaven. This is good leaven. We shared in the leaven video. In fact, let's, let me uh, show it for anybody that's new. Uh, right here. Unleavened to leavened. This was a great teaching with our brother Ivan because you begin to understand, hey, wait a second. Having some leaven, leaven sometimes is, is seen as negative, right, when it comes to sin, but there is also a positive because a little bit of leaven taken from the previous day had to be put into the new, into the new batch of dough being made so that it would leaven it, okay? And so this is something that we're going to talk about at the end because there is an incredible revelation in the three measures of meal it is wild okay so as i came and i was looking through this i started looking at the conversation happening before and i started looking at the conversation happening after in relation to what was going on with the mustard seed so, as we go into Luke, we see, starting in Luke 11, uh, uh, sorry, in Luke 13, verse 11. So, we're in Luke 13. Let's go to verse 11. Are you ready for this? Actually, starting in verse 10. You're going to notice these differences. This is a, like a twofold thing going on here tonight, that it's about the differences in the Gospels and the differences within the stories, but it's more than that, like I showed you in the Luke 19 triumphal entry typology, that what you're going to see here is that the conversation being had before the story of the, of the uh, uh, mustard seed and after the story of the mustard seed in all three Luke, Mark, and Matthew Gospels, is revealing to us the exact same story that we have understood in the differences of pre, mid, and post, being Luke, Mark, and Matthew. And you're going to see very incredible things. Like, watch this. 
if you're really paying attention, you'll notice things like this. Like, um, where's the other one? Like the parable of the sower. Okay. The parable of the sower is found in Matthew 13, just like the grain of mustard seed. The parable of the sower is found in Mark chapter 4, <clears throat> excuse me, just like the mustard seed. But the parable of the sower for Luke is in chapter 8. But the mustard seed is in 13. Well, why? Why, why weren't the stories in it just switched up to accommodate that the parable of the sower would come in 13 to accommodate the lineup like Matthew and Mark's? Why, why wouldn't it be in the same chapter? These might not be questions you've asked yourself before, but one, once you really see that, you know, people would argue and they say, oh, uh, uh, um, okay, the Spirit led everybody who wrote the Scriptures. But then when you say, oh, but so is the division of the chapters and the verses which it, within each book of the Bible. And for some reason, people think, oh, that's not true. That's not possible. It was just they were inspired who wrote it. Are you going to put God in a box that the Spirit's not powerful enough to inspire the people on where to divide the Gospels and how to separate the verses? We've proven. We can prove here in this ministry that it's absolutely true that this, those, every one of those uh, authors that that added the chapters and the verses were absolutely spirit-led. You don't have to know you're being spirit-led to be spirit-led. But we can prove it, and we've proven it here over many times over the years, dozens and hundreds of times over the years. Well, there's another one we could prove as well, and that is the purpose on how the stories are laid out and how they follow each other within any given chapter and so forth. The purpose like this, how Matthew and Mark have the sower in the same chapter as the grain of mustard seed, but Luke's doesn't. <laughs> There's an absolute reason for it, and you're going to see it. You're going to witness it for yourselves here tonight. So let's go into Luke chapter 13, starting in verse 10, and I want you to recognize something right off the bat. You can't tell right away, but when we go into Luke's por I mean Mark's portion and Matthew's portion, as I'll show you, you will recognize it right away. And that is that in Luke's portion, like I said, there's nothing about the parable of the sower. Okay? No parable of the sower. But we do get the story of the woman with the disabling spirit. And we get something that the entire conversation leads into, which is on the Sabbath or on the Sabbath day. Remember, we're in Luke. We're talking about something that happened pre and the coming of the Son of Man for 40 days. Okay? That above portion before the 14 years starts. So in Luke 13, 10, it says he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could not in no wise lift up herself. So, one, she couldn't lift up herself, right? She couldn't look up, lift up, rise herself, right? Of course, that would be because the Lord has to do it. And it's happening on the Sabbath. And what kind of woman was this? Specifically, a woman who is a type of wife. This woman is a wife type who is loosed from her infirmities. And in verse 13, and he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight, right? She was made straight, lifted up and glorified God. Huh. And when did it happen? It happened on a Sabbath day. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. And he gives them heck for it, right? And then it says, uh, and said unto the people, there are six days in which men ought to work. In them, therefore, come and be healed. 
and not on the Sabbath day. You seeing a little theme? A woman being healed, being made upright, straight, who is recognized as a wife being healed on the Sabbath day. On the Sabbath day. Then in verse 15, the Lord <clears throat> then answered him and said, You hypocrite, do not each of you on the Sabbath loose an ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to water? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? Four times so far, right? Four times. This woman being freed, who is referenced as a wife, being freed, being made upright, glorifying God on the Sabbath day. And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced of all the glorious things that were done by him. So a woman referenced as a wife being made upright and everybody glorifying him for everything that he did on this Sabbath day. Well, that's pretty interesting, isn't it? I thought right off the bat, that was very, very interesting, especially when the woman is specifically a wife. Do you know what happens when we go to Mark's? Watch what happens. Oh, actually, you know what? Before I even go there, let's keep going with this. Because I also want to touch on the fact of on the Sabbath, on the Sabbath day, on the Sabbath day, on the Sabbath, on the Sabbath day. There you go, five times. You think maybe they're trying to tell us something? Something about a woman being made upright, glorifying the Lord who is like a wife, glorifying on a Sabbath day. Do you know what day the Sabbaths are, right? We've been teaching this for a long time now. The Sabbath days are the 8th, the 15th, the 22nd, and the 29th of any given Hebrew month calendar date. The pre-trib is believed to, as we've been sharing for the past year, it's going to happen on the 8th of Av, regardless of what year it might be, although everything is absolutely pointing that we've revealed in 2024. What is the 8th of Av? Sabbath. It's the Sabbath day. That's right, brothers and sisters. It's the Sabbath day. So right off the bat, you have something very interestingly connected to Sabbath, the woman, like a wife, being made upright, glorifying. And at first, it actually might not even seem like anything overly crazy until you continue to read what the other Gospels say before the mustard seed. So let's go have a look at Mark. In Mark, it was in chapter 4. And look at what you're going to see. Of course, there's a great multitude being gathered to him. Huh. Isn't the mid-trib a great multitude? Funny how that works, right? Well, what does the great multitude have to go through? Watch this. We get the parable of the sower. And in Mark and in Matthew, what's the parable of the sower telling us? Look at chapter 4, uh, chapter four verse 17 of Mark. And have no root in themselves, and so endure for a time, Afterward, when affliction, see the word for tribulation, persecution, right? Or persecution ariseth for the world's sake, immediately they are offended. We've shared on this many times, right? The word for tribulation, uh, uh, trouble, right? Like affliction, the description of the word itself is never found in Luke's gospel. Did you guys know that? For anybody that's new, let me show you. This is the word for tribulation, affliction, and so forth, which you find in Matthew's discourse, which you find in uh, Mark's discourse, but you know where you don't find it? In Luke's gospel. Never mind his discourse. You see, Matthew, Matthew 24, Matthew 24, Matthew 24. You see? Look what's happening. There it is in Matthew 13, the conversation of tribulation directly related to Matthew 24. Only other place it's found is in Matthew 13. <coughs> and then 
we come to Mark, and it's in Mark chapter 4, exactly where we're talking about it, and it's directly related to Mark's discourse. Do we see Luke anywhere? Nope. No Luke. Because why? Luke is the pre-trib bride of Christ. She will not see tribulation. That's why she's not in there. That's why there is no affliction or persecution or tribulation coming to Luke's gospel. Because it is not coming to his Gentile bride who will be gorgeous, white-robed when she's taken, when she is lifted up as a wife. And glorifying him in, in excitement and joy. Watch Matthew's. Let's go to Matthew, <coughs> excuse me, chapter 13. You see how cool that was? Great multitudes. You see, the reason it's so exciting is because these stories, when you understand these differences in the Gospels, it gets extremely, extremely powerful. There it is, see? For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by, he is offended. You see? So you've got Jews that are offended. You've got those within the church that are offended. But the bride is never offended to stand up for the word of God. All right? So we're seeing these differences. And the reason that they're there is directly related to the timing of these groups. Let's go back into Mark. Uh, sorry, let's go back into Luke chapter 13. And we see after the woman and connected to the Sabbath day and rejoicing. Here, watch this. Now we see the story of the mustard seed and then going into the leaven as well. But we're going to start with the mustard seed. So it says, then said he unto what is the kingdom of God? And he relates it to the story of the mustard seed uh, into his garden. So it's something more specific than the others being garden. And then he says in verse 20. And again, he said, whereunto shall I liken the kingdom of God? For it is like leaven, which we, we shared in that video, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. What? Three measures of meal? What, what does that have to do with anything? Couldn't it just be, you know, uh, took a little leaven and put it in the other lump and made the whole lump whole? Why three measures? It's wild. But we're going to save that till the end. But what do we notice here to start? The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Everything is a reference here in Luke to the kingdom of God. Look what happens when we go to Mark. Mark chapter 4. We end up seeing... Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? We end up seeing, even from uh, the parable of the seed growing, it's the kingdom of God. Then we come down a little further, the mustard seed, the kingdom of God. It's all about the kingdom of God still. Okay? So in Luke, we have the kingdom of God. And in Mark, the story is all about the kingdom of God. Look what happens when we come to Matthew. And I don't want to go too far down in Matthew, man, because it gets so crazy obvious. It's, it's ridiculous. But watch what happens in Matthew. Parable of the weeds, and it starts in verse 24, the kingdom of heaven. We'll get into these in more detail, but it's the kingdom of heaven. What happens at the mustard seed and the leaven? The kingdom of heaven. Verse 33, the kingdom of heaven. All of these things in Matthew are related to the kingdom of heaven. Yet Mark and Luke are related to the kingdom of God. For those that have been around for a while, I know you already know what this is. But this confuses a lot of people in the church that haven't yet heard this. Though there are some that have understood it. But for the most part, people don't unless they really seek and search it out. And the reason is the kingdom of heaven has nothing to do with the church. Now, is there a remnant portion and so forth that works and will be resurrected? Yes, we already know that for the workers that put their necks on the line, right? But the kingdom of heaven is for the Jews. 
it is their promised kingdom of heaven on earth. The Mark and the Luke group, which relate to the church, theirs is the kingdom of God. So let me show you a great example of this. You guys will remember this. In Luke chapter, I think it's 20. Yeah, Luke chapter 22. We see when Jesus is going to have his Passover with his disciples. And we see starting in uh, Luke 22, 11 and 12. And you shall say unto the good man of the house, the master saith unto thee, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished there make ready. This word for upper room being above ground, this is talking about the kingdom of God. It's used only two times. When we come to Mark's in chapter 14, look at what we see in Mark's. We're in my idiot of the past. Oh, da, 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 da. We'll just go to verse 15. And it says in Mark 14, 15, and he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared there make ready for us this is one of those differences within the gospels why does mark also have the word prepared well we've shared what that means because this is a typology of the mid-trib rapture point and what is he showing it's not only a place furnished but also prepared you'll remember in john chapter 14 jesus says i go and prepare a place for you that when I return, hello, that's when he comes at the end of the six years of seals. When, when he's there in the seventh year of seals on heavenly Mount Zion, the stone that became a great mountain that crushed the ten toes, right? And the image from Daniel 2. He's coming with the place prepared. He said, I go and prepare a place in my father's house that when I return, I will receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. And why do you think it's in John 14? Because it's a direct correlation to the 14th year, not the end, but to the seventh year of seals when you understand the bigger picture of 21 years. But we're not going to go down that trail. So what do we see? The second place where this large upper room prepared is. Do you know what happens when you go to Matthew's? Matthew chapter 26 it's a completely different story. This is it. Right here. Matthew 26, 18. And he said, Go to the city to such a man and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. Did you hear about anything prepared? Any upper room above ground like like uh, like the kingdom of God would be? Nope. The revelation of it is the pre, the mid, and the post. What is the pre, the mid, and the post? The pre is a taking, the mid is a taking, and the post is a return. Go to the first one going to the kingdom of God, into the throne room, right? Into the inner part. Then you've got the kingdom of heaven, uh, the kingdom of God, which is the great multitude rapture. They're going to the paradise portion, the place prepared, connected to what? the father's house and then the return is when the lord returns feet down and theirs is the kingdom of heaven their promised millennial reign for the jews and where else do we prove this out so well where it all began with the 14 years right in second corinthians chapter 12 starting in verse 2 i knew a man in christ above 14 years ago that's the 50 days see these are the ones in christ they are in Christ spirit filled like Romans 8 in Christ spirit filled above 14 years ago, whether in the body, out of the body, I cannot tell. And then it says such an one caught up to the third heaven. Such an one means like. So it's not the rapture that everybody talks about. It is the pre-trib, but it's not going to be exactly the same as the rapture, but it's a type of rapture. And for those that say the rapture isn't in scripture, the word caught up in the Greek means harpazo. And harpazo in English means rapture. Okay? That is the word for rapture. And where does this first group above 14 years ago, where are they taken? They're taken to the third heaven. That's part of the kingdom of God. 
The second one in verse 3, and I knew such a man. So the first one was in Christ. This other one is kind of like in Christ. See, this is the group. Remember we were reading in Mark and in Matthew in relation to the parable of, of the sower and the two went through tribulation. Soon as there was a little offense come against them, they're like, oh, that's, that's this group. They, they kind of like. They believe, but they weren't ready because they weren't really in Christ, diligently seeking like an Enoch. Trusting in him, having faith that he was God and trust that he was a rewarder of those who diligently sought him. And Enoch never tasted of death. So this is the second group in the body, out of the body, I cannot tell. And it says how that he was caught up. So this one isn't like a rapture. This one is the rapture that people talk about. This rapture is the mid-trib great multitude rapture of Revelation chapter 7. The Lord had come on heavenly Mount Zion. And what happens? They're going to the place that he prepared. So a taking and a taking. Both of these takings are going to the upper room, which is the kingdom of God. And then what does Paul say? Then Paul, in this, this is the typology of it, right? Listen to what he says. Verse 14, 2 Corinthians 12, 14. Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you. A taking, a taking, and a return. In this story, Paul gives us a prophetic typology of a pre-taking, a mid-taking, and a post-trib coming to them, not bringing them any more burden, but because they were the parents, he came and did the things for the children first, and now he will deal with them and not bring them any more burden. Pre, mid, post. Taking, taking, return. So back into Luke 13, we're now seeing, and you can understand these things, that many of these things that we've taught on. You can see now how kingdom of God, kingdom of God for Luke and Mark, and Matthew's is the kingdom of heaven. You can see it right there in the stories, clearly written, and once you understand the differences in the Gospels, it all starts to make sense and open up. Now, look what happens. Remember, we're going to get back to this leaven. Remember, we taught on the leaven before, but we never caught the three measures and its meaning before. So let's go to see what comes next in Luke's chapter 13 after the story of the, uh, um, the mustard seed. Listen to what comes next. It's so awesome. Luke 13, 22. And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem, and said, uh, then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. That almost sounds like a contradiction of everything we've ever been told, right? All you have to do is call on the name of the Lord and you're, you're saved. You're golden. Just go back, keep living your life. Everything's fine. Not if you want to be the pre-trib Enoch. His Gentile bride. That's not what it says. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up, and hath shut to the door. And you begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Wow, right? You want to see how this is connected to pre? Do you know that in the, of course, of course, when you go to Mark and when you go to Matthew, do you think this storyline is what follows the ones in Mark and Matthew? Nope. You think maybe there's a reason it's here? Absolutely. Because this is all pre-conversation. Do you guys know this one? You already know where this is connected, don't you? In Luke 13, 25, 
And when the master of the house has risen up and shuts the door, then it's too late. It's too late for anybody else to come preach. You want me to prove it to you? John chapter 20. Remember, John chapter 20 is this beginning portion related to the start of the 50 days, right? The, the pre-trib and the 50 days beginning. But it's also a prophetic picture when it wraps around again to the end of the 20 years or the end of, you see, it's seven easy years, seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets. So we know this is at that, that end of the 20th year. We know what happens in the again, okay? But it also starts the story of the 50 days, the above portion. And it's all about Mary Magdalene. We've shared about Mary Magdalene before, where her name comes from, right? Which means tower, which comes from the Hebrew, which is the towers of the better roses and, and the breasts, right? From the Song of Solomon and his bride. You want to know why this is so awesome? Let me let me just go to it real quick. A little A little side note, nothing new here, right? <laughs> Come on, where are you? Song of Solomon. Chapter 3, I believe it is. The bride's dream, right? And he talks about her, and he talks about her breasts and how beautiful and everything she is, right? Well, look at chapter, look at verse 3. Song of Solomon, cha sorry, chapter 3, verse 11. Go forth, O daughters of Zion, and behold King Solomon with the crown wherewith his mother crowned him on the day of his espousals okay we know that the the woman who is who, who had crowned right in relation to the white horse rider but what do we know for the seven churches from the ministry revealed book this is the time of the beginning of the 50 days right right after the pre-trib has happened ephesus represents that first week which is the bridal wedding week now, Ephesus remains during seals time, but it begins the 50 days at the pre-trib. And when the Lord returns from the wedding, it starts Smyrna, which represents the 40 days of the Son of Man, as we've taught before. But both of these will remain during seals. They're, they're going to serve the Lord, apostles and disciples. But what happens during the very first week of the above? It's the day of Israel's espousals. It's the day of Israel's espousals. It's a typology like King Solomon and he's being given a crown by his mother in the day of his espousals. And what's the picture of who the one is being married here, who, whose breasts and like lilies and all of these things about her is directly related to the tower and the bed of flowers which is directly in correlation to the pre-trib of Mary Magdalene as the typology of the bride. And we've talked on that before right here. Okay? I have not yet ascended to my father. This is a, this is a type of him coming for his bride. And the typology of it is Mary Magdalene. I'm not saying Jesus Mary ma married Mary Magdalene. I'm saying she is a prophetic picture of the future typology of the bride being taken out. So maybe it makes sense. Now you can probably see why in the church there's been this belief, this, this, what, however they come across it, to believe that Jesus was really married and had kids with Mary Magdalene. Because there is a typology of it within the scriptures. But not in that sense. It's prophetic. It's directly related to the is to come. And we've shown it. This is something we've shared on before as well. But now, watch what happens. So what, what's this picture of? Bang. The bride is taken. The disciples are now prepared, waiting for the Lord for when he will return from the wedding. And what happens? He has taken the bride. The disciples are waiting. Right? The, the Smyrna group are waiting till after the wedding. They're, they're here waiting for the Lord's to return, the Lord to return and knock on the door. But what does the Lord do? Before the wedding starts, he comes back on the same day that the pre-trib has happened. 
and he comes back at evening. And listen to what he says. Beginning the first day of the week, remember the pre happens on the Sabbath, right at the end of the Sabbath. Which means when he comes back the same day at evening, it's now the first day of the week. And what does it start with? When the door was shut. Funny how that happens, right? Then the door was shut. What was he warning about in this entire story? What are we seeing in the story here of Luke chapter 13 as we track it and follow it through? Look what happens. Strive to enter in by the straight gate because when I come and I take out my bride and I return that same day, I'm coming in the evening portion, which would be the first day of the next week, uh, uh, the, the first day of the, of the new week. <clears throat> what happens? He shuts the door. Anybody trying to come in now? Too late. You weren't ready. You weren't diligently, diligently seeking and searching him. You weren't repentant and loving. Or you were, you were falling short on these things. Isn't that awesome? And then, of course, he laments over Jerusalem. Look at how he ends Luke 13, 30, in 34. <clears throat> oh, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often I would have gathered, gathered thy children together as a hen does gather her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And verily I say unto you, you shall not see me <coughs> excuse me, until the time come when you shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. What's this warning, guys? It's the same warning I was showing you in, in Luke 19, which Luke 19 is a prophetic picture of him coming to start his 40 days. And he's warning, as he said he would, as Jonah did from Luke 11 and going to Luke's discourse in chapter 21. It's all about warning that they're about to be compassed about and then destroyed. Everything, it, the whole thing is in order. It's awesome. And when, you see, it's one thing to read the story in just Luke. You wouldn't necessarily know. You wouldn't, you wouldn't read it and say, Oh, okay, I could see this being pre. Have you ever heard me talk on this before and teach how this chapter is, is laid out as this pre in the time of the Lord coming in the above? No, I've never taught on this before. It wasn't until I looked at all three Gospels in order of Luke, Mark, and Matthew and went to the stories above and the stories after, and I said, wait a second, this starts to sound familiar like every other hundreds of times we've gone through it. The warnings are the same. The, the events, the, the storylines of, of what should be taking place are right there. Even something with, with as simple as this woman being healed on the Sabbath. When you follow the storyline, it all lines up and makes sense. So now... Let's go see what our brother Mark in chapter 4 continues on to tell us. So Mark chapter 4, as we said, it starts really with the, uh, uh, the parable of the sower and right this persecution that's coming, which we know their portion. That's why the persecution, the word, the number for affliction, the word for it, is also in Mark's discourse. They're going through their tribulation portion. And then we come down a little further. We come to Mark 4, verse 26, the parable of the seed growing. And it starts right off with what? And he said, this is the kingdom of God. Uh, sorry, so is the kingdom of God. As if a man could cast seed into the garden and he goes on uh verse 28 for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself first the blade then the ear after the full 
corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come. What do you think this is about? Of course, it's about wheat, right? Corn, wheat. Remember, we did a video not too long ago proving, proving the mid-trib great multitude rapture of the main harvest of wheat. We've shown over the years how it's connected to the spring wheat and the spring wheat. When is it going to happen? Well, it's harvested in the fall, but they can't use it until Passover of the following year. That's why the great multitude rapture happens in the midst of the seventh year of tribulation. Well, look at what it says about this wheat. It says complete. Complete. Because it's the main harvest. The first fruits were the pre-trib, the main harvest, and then what would be left? Well, you would still have a corners and gleaning typology too, right? You have to have a, a, a corners and gleaning at the end of it all. So, because that's how a harvest works. If this screen is, is a field of, of wheat, the first fruits given to the Father. So, out of about 1.5 actual claiming Christians on the earth, you've got a first fruits of about 150 million, which I believe will be exactly 144 million pre-trib. And then... You've got the main harvest, and that main harvest would be about 1.2, give or take, billion. That's why the greatest revival in human history is going to happen after the pre-trib and during the time of seals before the mark of the beast. And then what are you going to be left with? Corners and gleaning. It's fantastic. So we're seeing the full of the corn, and it says, but when the fruit is brought forth, Immediately, okay, when the fruit is brought forth as what? As plucked, which is what? Harpazo. Harpazo. Love it how that works, right? Immediately he putteth in the sickle. Did we read any of these stories in Luke's portion before the parable of the mustard seed? Nope. In fact, it would have been impossible that this could have been in Luke's portion. Because look at the word sickle. Those of you who have been around for a while have seen it. But if you're newer, this is the word for sickle. It's only used eight times in scripture. It's connected to the word pluck, which is the word, as we just saw here, for the fruit, which is fruit being plucked as harpazo. And this word for sickle, check it out. It's used eight times. Do you know where it's used in all of Scripture? Out of all of the Gospels, it's used one time in all of the Gospels. Right there in Mark chapter 4, verse 29. What? There's got to be a reason for it, right? Of course there is. The other place it shows up is Revelation chapter 14. Which, again, because I hadn't considered this, we knew this, we talked this a few years ago, but because it hadn't come back to my memory in a long time, when I was putting this together, it dawned on me again, because we're really, I've been really, I've got so many things that I'm studying in relation and connecting to, to Babylon and Mystery Babylon and, and her destruction and then coming back and is she coming back? When is, is it really destroyed here and then come back later? And, and, and I'm digging into this sucker like crazy and I'm having little breakthroughs here and there and people are sharing things with me and we're kind of going back and forth in these things. But this is another one to add into the arsenal because this is the picture, the conversation at the time of the great multitude rapture. And the only other place the word sickle is used is in Revelation 14. And it starts with Revelation 14.14. 14. Okay? So there's something going on here, which, again, just like we showed in a previous video, mystery ba or Babylon being destroyed at the end of seals. So it, it's kind of starting to make sense that, okay, well, if Babylon is destroyed at the end of seals, now, again, 
I don't yet have the have that flowing connection to show where she comes back, right? Because we know there's something else, but to be able to show in scripture how Babylon comes back at the at the later point in trumpet judgments, I don't have that connection yet. But knowing what we know about Babylon being destroyed at the end of the six years of seals, and seeing that the sickle of the harvest is the mid trib great multitude rapture. It now makes sense that Babylon fallen in Revelation 14 is related to the end of seals. Okay. But it's going to open up some other mysteries. Some other pieces that we then got to go into. But this definitely helps add to that fuel in the understanding from the previous video or a previous video that indeed she is destroyed uh, at the end of seals before however it would work that she comes back okay so there's our sickle and there's our mid-trip portion funny how that happens right the fullness of the corn harpazzo the sickle mid-trip great multitude rapture they're taken where to paradise which is where in the kingdom of god well let's keep going um we see again here's something else we see that's interesting because we don't see it in uh luke's gospel at all, at all but we do see it in mark uh a little in in here and we see it in matthew it says uh let's start in verse 33 and with many such parables spake he the word unto them and they were able to hear it but without a parable spake he not unto them and when they were alone he expounded all things to his disciples you see not everybody is given to receive and hear and understand the revelations but to his disciples they were able to receive the revelation and the understanding of it now watch this we're coming to the end of Luke's uh, of Mark's portion and check this out. This is a this is a little just one of those interesting things how how it flows right into the timing. Because remember what happens what happens with the great multitude rapture? Well, the great multitude rapture, which is the representation of Rachel, right? Or if you want to say Rachel, the the children and and how it's connected, but is related to the younger which is the spring wheat the spring wheat is planted in the spring rachel uh, uh, leah was the pre-trib the older before the younger that is winter wheat planted in the fall harvested in the summer and it's done around august hence we know where that connection in time is and with rachel she is the younger, which represents the younger wheat, and the older had to go before the younger, according to Genesis 29 with Jacob and, and his wives and with his father-in-law and all that. So Leah being the older, Rachel being the younger, this is related to the Rachel younger, which is the spring wheat, and the spring wheat is harvested when? It's harvested in the fall. It's harvested in the fall. However, it cannot be observed. It cannot be used because it's called new wheat. It cannot be used until the second day of Passover. We've shared on this many times, many, many times, and some incredible revelations about it this past, excuse me, this past year. In fact, like just over the last few months in understanding why jesus said what he said in john chapter 4 how it relates to how the the apostles were looking to new wheat instead of instead of the older wheat they were looking to rachel as the jews always do instead of looking to the leah who was ready to be harvested four months earlier but now here's the kicker we know that it can't be observed until passover we've revealed these things in the three feasts of the lord we know Feast of Weeks comes first, true Feast of Weeks. Then it's Passover, six years, and the seventh is the assembly to the Lord 
and then tabernacles seven years and then the new beginning of the eighth day that's that is the revelation of the end of days pre-trib mid-trib post-trib the 15th year the new beginning is that eighth day of tabernacles and it's the final jubilee so what do we see after this well again all we're doing is following this in order here they were they went through the tribulation of seals it's the time for their harvest to the kingdom of god at the fullness of the corn when the sickle is put in to harvest them and they're being taken to the kingdom of god of the paradise portion and what happens when do they get observed passover we're just following the stories that come one after the other listen listen to this in mark 4 35 and the same day when the even when the even was come he saith unto them let us pass over unto the other side and you think oh now you're just stretching alan do you know what's wild about this i just showed you and you guys tracked it here just in here in following story after story being laid out in chapter four it's the picture of seals them going through seals through the tribulation of mark's discourse then it's time for the harvest and it's the fullness of the harvest which is the great multitude rapture and then he's taking them over to the other side which is related to passover do you know why this is important who's the one that's going to take him to the other side jesus what do we show in the revelation of prophecy that seals represents the moses portion right the moses elijah but in this case i'm talking specifically moses moses is the one that's going to what watch this moses is going to be the one who when the like i don't mean the moses but a moses type right these people during seals the remnant workers in the two and a half three year time frame right is when they're going to flee into the wilderness when the beast gets his power to continue for 42 months they're going to flee into the wilderness which in the story of the books of the seven churches here's when they flee into the wilderness which is represented by the time of pergamum and what's going to happen while they're there the lord's going to give them manna right watch this let's go to revelation chapter 2 and what do we see happen who is the one that that historically that everybody we know he took them into the wilderness it was moses right and what's the lord going to do he's going to give them of the hidden manna he's going to feed them when they flee into the wilderness and it's directly connected to pergamum which we recently taught on with the doctrine of balaam and balak you see how awesome it is this is a direct picture of when the beast gets his power to continue for 42 months this is when he comes on the scene the false prophet and the beast it, it it was so awesome and we explained exactly and i don't i'm not going to get into it all now how and where it's related to the book of numbers specifically chapter 19 and what it said would happen when that period of seals comes to an end when the lord comes on heavenly mount zion and destroys them it's awesome but what did we see we saw him feeding them in the wilderness let's go back to mark chapter 4 and we know so in following this again we know that this is mark's discourse when they flee into the wilderness because it's the time of revelation 13 the mark of the beast and he's going to feed them of the manna so who is the prophetic typology here moses moses the one leading them into the wilderness and then moses leading them out of the wilderness right when the when the end of the six year of seals comes but what happened to moses moses didn't get to what pass over moses had to die and who came joshua 
Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus shows up and takes them what? He passes them over to the other side, going to the land of their promise. We've taught on this many times. It's a prophetic picture of Christ when he comes at the end of the sixth year of seals and he will cross them over in the seventh year of seals for the great multitude rapture. That's exactly what we're reading here as we follow it in order. And we're seeing him then say, let us pass over unto the other side. You can click on it and you can say, oh, Alan, this is about crossing to the other side. Yeah, exactly. And, and what was the relation of it? Passover, right? So what do we see that this is actually saying? He's going to take them over, like crossing the sea, crossing them to the other side, right? Well, let's, let's just make sure. Believe me, I wanted to make sure too. So I went into the Greek word, which is 1330, which is the one that you just saw here, okay? Used 42 times for passing over, through, across, all that type of stuff, okay? Let me show you <laughs> in how many times it's actually used as Passover, okay? Walk, go. There's the one from Mark. Passover. Only used one time in Mark, and it's the term Passover. Luke, us go now, through, passing, there, abroad, go over, went, walketh, he passed, through, passed that way, go, going through. None of the other places in 42 times where it's used throughout the New Testament only one time in one place in Mark chapter 4 35 they use the term Passover do you see what I'm saying are you following how this directly is correlating within the stories of the pre and the above portion of the seals portion of Mark's discourse to the end and the great multitude rapture of the wheat with the sickle and their time being at Passover. <laughs> I love this kind of stuff, guys. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but this kind of stuff, I just get giddy because to, to comprehend it, to put it together, to, to see how the spirit leads in this, not because it's me showing it, but because you follow the whole storyline. This means that we're clearly being spirit-led because this isn't the first time. This is like the 1,000th time. We're, and not only us being led, but it meant not only the writers were being led by the spirit when they were writing these things out, but it meant those who were giving the word definitions were being spirit-led, who did the Septuagint and the Strongs. It means those who were doing the chapters and the verses were being spirit-led in how they were laid out and how they divided them. This is just incredible, incredible detail of evidence. It's so awesome. It's so, so awesome. What are the chances? We come to the end of the chapter. Right near the end of the chapter. And the story flowed from the beginning of seals till the end when they're taken at Passover by the one who's taken them to the other side at Passover. It's so awesome. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew chapter 13, let's see how his plays out. Let's keep going, going, going. So we're starting to see the kingdom of heaven now. Okay? And we've covered that. Now watch what happens. Look at what we see here. Look at what we see before, before the parable of the sower. And we're seeing their tribulation and persecution. 
which represents Matthew's discourse tribulation. That's why, do you see how, do you see how powerful this is? When we were able to show that the, the purpose of the wording, right? When we were able to show that it's used in Matthew 13 and then Matthew 24, in Mark 4 and in Mark 13. It's, it's, it's directly relating us. It's telling you that the connection is to their portions of tribulation. It's literally telling us that. But there's no possible way to understand it without first the revelation and tracking and understanding the discourses, the, the, the differences within the Gospels. It's wild. <clears throat> so we see all this, but now look what comes first. In Matthew 13, starting in verse 14, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. Well, which prophecy is that? Which saith, by hearing you shall hear and shall not understand. And in seeing you shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing. And their eyes have, uh, they have closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. And should understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see things which you see and have not seen them, and to hear things which you hear and have not heard them. Why is he telling? Who is he telling? Do you notice when this is? <coughs> if we just went through a portion of seals, and now we're coming to the portion of trumpets, right? End of seals to start of trumpets. If if there's a portion that he is made dull of hearing and to not see and to not understand, but there's also a group that he has, who are the ones that he's blessed that, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see these things which these guys now see? You think maybe he's speaking to the 144? Because the 144 is sealed before what? Before the tribulation of Matthew's discourse. You see how that works? And what is this prophecy? What is this prophecy of this group that is still of dull of hearing? Well, we know this one very well as well. It comes from Isaiah 6. From Isaiah chapter 6, when the Lord says, send me, or when Isaiah, right, in, in a typology, says, uh, then said I here, I, here am I, send me. And he said, go, tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. So he was to make their eyes, right, their, their heart fat, uh, make their eyes heavy lest they should see and hear and be converted and be healed. <coughs> he then says, Then said I, How long? And he answered, Till the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without men, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have far removed men, uh, and the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet, in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and it shall be eaten, and so on and so forth. We've talked about this, right? And look at who the story begins with. There were seraphim. Remember, the seraphim are around the throne of the Father, the Lord God Father, all uppercase. The seraphim are related to what? The serpent. Remember, Satan was a seraphim. Lucifer was a cherubim. When does Satan get cast down? Mid-trumpets. Satan loses his battle that he has against Michael and his angels with Satan and his angels. And he is cast down at mid-trumpets 
when the at the fifth trumpet, the first woe, the pit is opened. That's the seraphim. Now, these are the good seraphim here, right, being spoken about, but Satan directly in relation to this time who is a seraph who was a seraphim is the fiery serpent when he's being cast down and we have this conversation right here in relation to them being cast out being destroyed being ransacked and everything else so we saying that there will be some that will get converted right but the majority aren't going to get converted until all of this devastation, the cities be laid without be laid to waste and everything. Well, when do we see this? If we go to Zechariah chapter 14, that's where it begins, doesn't it? The day of the Lord. In Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken. And the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Is ravishing destruction. Remember what happens in Daniel, in Daniel chapter 12. When Satan the seraphim is cast down and the pit is opened, we know it's this time of trouble like never before, which is Matthew's discourse when they're now fleeing like revelation 12 14 into the wilderness right and they're of course not all of them are going there's still going to be people that remain that didn't that weren't with the lord right and what were we told it says the angel saying how long how long is this going to go on for and in uh daniel 12 7 halfway through that it shall be for a time times and a half there's no end between time and times that means two and a half years one, two, plus a half. Of the final three and a half years, Satan being cast down in the pit open, they're going to have two and a half years, which brings you to the end of 13 years from mid-trumpets. So now they're at the end of 13 years, and what will he have done? And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. You see, when are they all finished? As soon as the seventh trumpet begins to sound, which is the beginning of the seventh year of trumpet judgments, which is the 14th year of tribulation, which means Satan had two and a half years from when the pit was open to what? To scatter the people, to scatter them, to bring devastation, to do all these things that we know are coming at mid trumpet judgments at the ten and a half year mark, which is Matthew's discourse when they're to flee to the mountains or to the wilderness. It's this devastation that we're reading about. That's why we're seeing the exact description being from the prophecy of Isaiah. Did did it get did it get caught was it talked about in Mark's? No. Was it talked about in Luke's? No. Then what's the purpose? It's the order the order is revealing these things to us. Here's your persecution, the Mark portion of tribulation, uh, sorry, the Matthew portion of tribulation of Matthew's discourse. And then let's keep reading. Then we see the kingdom of heaven. And listen to what it says. Remember, the story of Isaiah was Satan. Right? The, the, the picture of the seraphim was also connected to them being blinded because the the enemy, the evil, wicked seraphim, which is the enemy, which is Satan, is cast down at mid-trumpets, which is Matthew's portion. And Matthew's portion, theirs, is going to be the kingdom of heaven. And look what happens. The parable of the weeds. But while men slept, the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Huh. Suddenly, the enemy and Satan and the story of the wheat and the tares, which is only found in Matthew, which, by the way, when we go into it, you see it's all in the same time frame. You see this? There's the parable of the mustard seed. There's the wheat and tares, only found in Matthew. Here was the parable of the sower. 
Look at that. 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4. But not Luke. 13, 13. Look at this. 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, and then 9, 9. But this one is, these two are 13. See how that happens? Just, it seems, it seems nonsensical in how it lines up with everything else in relation to these scriptures. Yet there it is. There is purpose. These mysterious, these mysteries that are just laden throughout the entirety of scripture. We barely, for as much as we have been revealed, we still barely know anything. But we know more than has ever been revealed. And it's all for preparing for the is to come. So here we have the enemy that came in, planted tares among the wheat. Well, which portion of wheat? Remember what I said? First fruits of wheat. That's the pre-trib. Then you can look at the big picture, which is the rest of the screen. That's the mid-trib great multitude rapture. And then what would be left? The picture of corners and gleaning. We've actually got a... I got a, a picture of this type of thing, but I didn't have it prepared and it would take a minute to find it. But we we actually we I think we even show it a bit in the book too. Oh, you know what? Let me let me have a quick look. I don't think I've got it here. No, I don't. I used to have it on here. No. Um but it shows as I was saying, you know, if you take the whole screen. So if you put God the Father up here, then you would have like first fruits, you would have main harvest, and then you would have corners and gleaning. But within the story of the end of days, you also have one that relates to wheat, and you have one that relates to fruit or grapes, more specifically. So the wheat is is the is the house of Israel, Gentiles grafted in, the pre, the mid, but there's always a post. Because it's the corners and gleaning. And then you've got the grapes. And there's the pre, there's a mid, and there's a post. Because there's always a first fruits, a main harvest, and then corners and gleaning. But in the big picture of things, God being at the top, there's a pre, a mid, and a post of all of the earth. And that's what I'm talking about here in relation to this wheat. The first fruits of all the earth, the main harvest of all the earth, and then the corners and gleaning of the earth. And so here we have now the enemy being described here as Satan, who is the one directly described when Isaiah was saying this in Matthew 14, connected to the seraphim who were there. You see the connection, Satan, the seraphim. But Satan was of the bad one of the seraphim. And they're around the kingdom of the, the throne of the father. So again, we're seeing this play out, which gets us to what? That mid-trumpet's time frame. So you're seeing the, the tribulation, right? The affliction, Matthew's discourse. You're seeing the enemy come down, sow in some of these tares among it. And then let's read from verse 13, uh, uh, verse 30. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into the barn and burn them. We didn't see any of this in, in Matthew or Luke. Do you know where this burning is connected to as well? It's the final battle, right? It's this battle. It's related to when the Lord is returned feet down on the Mount of Olives, as we see in Zechariah. And what do we see? It starts with, um, if you guys remember this battle, in Zechariah chapter 14, starting in verse 2, it says, And I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And when we come down to verse 3, it says, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. It's a different battle. Because as we've shared many times here, this battle that he's talking about, this as when he fought, this is the one at the end of seals. The one that he's talking about here 
is going to be, he's going to fight against them, he's saying, as when he fought like in this other one. Which means there are two battles, which we revealed there are two swords. And what are the two swords? Revelation 17, when they fight against the lamb and the lamb defeats them. And Revelation 19, which is the great winepress of the wrath of Almighty God at what? The day of the Lord. Hello. It's, it's wild how it works. When we track these things, I don't want to go too far off on a tangent, but what you come to see is that Ephraim is the one that has a big issue. Ephraim has a lot of things that will take place during the time of trumpets, during the, the trumpet judgments. But in the end, his iniquity will be, will be removed. The father will, will say, okay, that's enough. You've endured. You've gone through this. You've now repented fully. Bang, we're good, and it'll be all over. When you track the story and you go to Psalms chapter 78, <clears throat> you see that it was Ephraim who refused to go to war, right? In 78 verse 9, the children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows turned back in the day of battle. See, this was the battle. This was that first battle that the Lord said that he fought in, which is the Ezekiel 39 battle at the end of the six year of seals and something is going to happen with Ephraim and that's what's going to cause him to turn and be rebellious and you know stubborn rebellion and these things that are going to happen during trumpets have a lot of relation to stuff going on with Ephraim which is probably why Ephraim's name relates to double fruit right which there's more to it <coughs> as we know but I don't want to go down a, a, a huge rabbit trail That'll just be for some of you guys that have understood some of these things in the past. So, as we come back to... Am I in the right spot? Oops, 13. Matthew 13. Look at how this continues to play out. We see the reapers. We know the burning. Oh, that's what I was saying. So, this burning, even in Zechariah 14, we know that this burning... So, we know what point we're at. By following this, this storyline from Luke to Mark to Matthew, we know where we're at. We should be coming to what? We should be coming to the point of the end of the world when the Lord will then be here for the millennial reign. That's where we should be coming to this point. And look at what we see in relation to this battle. When the Lord comes and does this, listen to what he says. Um, verse 9, Zechariah 14. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. And uh, all the land shall be turned to a plain, blah, 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 lifted up from a place. Uh, oh, yeah. Unto the corner gate and from the tower of Hanel unto the king's wine press. Right? The crushing of grapes. The great wine press of the wrath of Almighty God. Which is kind of interesting. Let me show you this little side note. Because this wine press of Almighty God, we know is directly related to what we know about what? Joel in order. The pre, the mid, the post, the Luke, the Mark, the Matthew. So what what should we see in Zechariah in Joel chapter three? And and why am I bringing it to this in relation to what's being said about the wine press there? Proclaim you to the Gentiles, prepare war, make up, uh, wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. You guys remember what happens at the end of seals? At the end of the sixth year of seals, the Lord tells them to beat their, their, their swords, their weapons into pruning hooks. Right? And it says in Zechariah, chapter uh, 39 that for seven years they'll be burning weapons well what are those seven years equal the world of seven years of tribulation in the church will tell you that oh it's got to be the seven years of the first seven years of the millennial reign why would the lord be burning weapons for fuel for the first seven years during the millennial reign when he's here there'd be no need when you understand the 14 years why 
because it's the seventh year of seals after he's destroyed them at the end of the sixth year in the Ezekiel 39 war. The weapons will be, what, burned for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years. It's the seventh year of seals, the six years of trumpets, which is why after having had them and burning them and turned them into pruning hooks and everything else for seven years, in the 14th year, when they're going to have to now go back to battle, we then see the time of the wine press. But when we go to Joel chapter 3, we can understand why when the Lord's going to judge all nations, we see that he tells them to now beat their plowshares into swords and pruning hooks into spears. And then what does he say? Verse verse uh, Joel 3, verse 13. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. It's the wine press of Almighty God for the wicked. After what? The war. The war, this destruction that he's bringing against them. And what does he say that follows next in Zechariah chapter 14? In verse 12, he tells them, And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongues shall consume away in their mouth. Sound like some kind of crazy fire? We all know it kind of sounds like nuclear bombs, right? But what would that mean? Burning. An intense, incredible burning in the fire. And what did he say he would do? Well, the chaff is going to be thrown into what? It's going to be burnt. All the chaff, all those that came against are going to be burnt. And... Of course, then Satan will be bound. And what do they get? What's coming for them? The kingdom of heaven is now coming for the Jewish people. And look at what we see. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in. <clears throat> Let me change my coloring. And hid in three measures of meal. We're not going there yet. We're almost there. Okay? And hid in three measures of meal. Then you see prophecy and parables. And look at what we see. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open their mouths in parables, right? And uttering these things, secret kept from the foundation of the world. Uh, parable of the weeds explained. Talking about that wicked one. Who is that wicked one? This is relation. This is related to uh, um, Satan, of course, and the enemy that sowed them is the devil. The devil. This story is only in Matthew's, not in Mark's, not in Luke's. When we follow the storyline, Luke, Mark, Matthew of these chapters, we're seeing we're seeing the the events, the the revelation of prophecy through the whole storyline. And so look at what happens. It says that in verse 39 of Matthew 13, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. <laughs> so the son of man shall send forth his angels and shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom. Listen to this. In the kingdom of of their father who hath ears to hear this is, 
who hath ears to hear, let them hear. And then we keep going and listen to what it says. Verse 47, and the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered every kind. Wait a second. That sounds familiar. So where are we? We're in the final year, the 21st year. The Lord has returned to start the year, feet down on the Mount of Olives, like Zechariah 14. He has destroyed the enemy. He has bound up Satan. He has burned the tares. He's talking now about the end of the world. We've read it like three times, and there's like two or three more times that it's coming. In the big picture, it's the 21st year. So we go to John chapter 21. Do you think we're going to see something about a net cast into the sea to gather every kind of fish? Huh. <laughs> this is crazy. What about if we go read John chapter 21? And Simon Peter, verse 11, And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of fishes, 153 and for all, there were so many, yet the net was not broken. You guys know the rest of the story. We've got a video that we did about this uh, a few months back. Maybe not quite a few months. Sometimes it feels way longer. Let's see. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Okay, it was a few months back. Right here. The 153 fish. This... <laughs> It was a huge revelation because it's something many of us in the prophecy world have been seeking to understand for a long, long time. And for the longest time, I didn't fully understand it. There were little bits here and there, but I never believed it to be connected to pre-trib or any of that stuff or mid-trib. Because why? Because it's in John chapter 21. I knew it had a post-trib connection. And in this video, we finally were able to reveal, what's that, six, seven months ago, what it was talking about. And what is it talking about? It's the revelation of the SEALs workers, the remnant workers of the Smyrna group, the Luke group, that were putting their necks on the line during SEALs, who will take part in the first resurrection on such, the second death has no uh, um, has no power. Everybody else, though, doesn't take part in the first resurrection. The rest will be after the millennial reign. These fish and the revelation of them being caught is directly related to those who will take part in the resurrection of the just, which are the remnant workers who put their necks on the line to serve the Lord as little stones, as little lambs like the Lord, to take part in his glory with them in the end of days. And they're the ones that will what? <coughs> that will sit with him in his throne as he sits in his father, in his father's throne with his. So this is what we're seeing. If we follow, again, I'm, I'm reiterating these things because I want you guys to understand. Follow Follow this in order to everything you, that you've understood over the years, over the several months of your studying of how the end of days play out in the above, the seven years of seals, and the seven years of trumpets. And you're seeing it play out. It's incredible. Look at now, as we bring this to an end, look at um, Matthew 13, 49. So shall it be at the end of the world. Again, at the end of the world, kingdom of heaven, uh, kingdom of uh, end of the world, end of the world, right? I think we saw it somewhere up here as well. Three or four times we've seen end of the world, end of the world, end of the world. Did we see end of the world in Mark? Nope. Did we see it in Luke? Nope. We only find it in Matthew's portion. Well, look what happens if you go to look for end of the world and we go to Matthew's discourse. Let's go to not only his discourse, but let's go to Matthew's gospel. 
starting in the discourse in Matthew 34, verse 3, uh, towards the end of it, or say halfway through, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? You guys know this well. For those of you that don't, this Greek word, 3952, let me show you how awesome it is. This word is only used in Matthew's gospel in his discourse. Look at that. This coming of the Lord is when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives to begin the 14th year of tribulation. Like Zechariah chapter 14, the beginning of the year. It is when he comes as what? Well, it's the sign of his coming and the end of the world, right? Well, let's go down to the coming of the Son of Man, right? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, you see? So anybody that tries to tell you Matthew 24 is trying to tell you pre-trib, they're not reading very closely because it says immediately after the tribulation of those days. So what do we know is coming? Well, it's going to be the day and hour that no one knows. So listen to what it says. And we know that the day and hour no one knows is the Feast of Trumpets. So this will be the beginning of the 14th year. The start of the 14th year will be at the Feast of Trumpets, which is a two-day event of the day and hour no one knows. So what do we see? But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. What did it say? When is, it, when is your coming and the end of the world? And he's telling you, my coming, which is going to be at the time of the end of the world, which is, you know, it's a picture of him coming. And then you've got, of course, the 14th year and millennial reign. But this 14th year that he comes to fulfill is the one that's going to be as Noah's. And that year is exactly one year and 10 days long. You guys all know this very well. This final year, which is the 49th year of the seven times seven years of the Sabbath count, which means this 22nd in the big picture or this 15th year is also the 49th year in the, in the full picture of a Jubilee count. And the days of Noah were counted as what? One year and 10 days long, which means from the Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows at his coming, to the end of that year, Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows, 10 more days is the sounding of the shofar of the blast on the Day of Atonement. And Leviticus 25 tells us it'll be the blasting of the Jubilee of the trumpet, the trumpet of the Jubilee on the Day of Atonement 10 days later. So if you've got one year from Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets, 10 days later is what? atonement and the the sounding of the trumpet for the jubilee so what is he saying we're finding that christ is coming at at the time it'll be as it was in the days of noah and what it, what was he asking and the end of the world watch what happens when we go to matthew chapter 28 look at what he says do you guys remember all of these things? We've done this with Luke's gospel, Mark's gospel, Matthew's gospel. When you go to the end of each one, in twenty, in Matthew 28, 20, this is a picture of the Lord's return and him here now until the end of the world. It says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Who is he talking to? He's talking now to the remnant, uh, um, the, the 12 tribes, chosen of the 12 tribes, who are going to now go serve and teach the world the ways of the Lord. The world that's left, they're going to be learning the ways of the Lord from the 12 tribes during the millennial reign. And that's why the Lord is saying, I'm with you now, even until the end of the world. So what a coincidence. What a coincidence that. Matthew's gospel is the one that talks about end of the world, end of the world, end of the world. Mark's had his portion of his conversations. Luke's had his portion in his conversations. 
all of them revealing to us the above, the seven years of seals, and the seven years of trumpets. I had never, ever noticed this before. And it's probably because I've never really, you know, if I've looked at these stories, like we've spoken on these stories before, like portions, I should say, of these stories before. But never have I looked before and compared what the stories were telling us in each one differently and then gone to the stories after to see what the stories were telling us differently. Like I said at the beginning, I didn't know what I was going to teach until I was spirit led to go look at the at the tabs that I had and say, wait a second. Yeah, let me go have another look at this story that I talked about uh, uh, that I had discovered something in relation to being connected with the story of the mustard seed. I, I had never done this. This wasn't till today, maybe last night today. No, it was this afternoon. I didn't have any of this, <laughs> just so you know. I didn't know any of this until late this, late this morning, early afternoon, that this started to reveal itself. It's, it's wild. This is what we call seeing with end time eyes. When you see these things open and you could track them and follow them, it's absolutely incredible. So now, Let's bring this to its conclusion with this incredible piece. I showed you how and explained briefly how in, um, <laughs> see how great that was, like Sabbath day, Sabbath day, Sabbath day. Then you go to Mark's and it's got his thing that it says over and over. Then you go to Matthew and it's end of the world, end of the world, end of the world. It's, it's awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome to be able to see and to track and to understand these things. It's beautiful. So now what we're going to talk about is this piece that's found in Matthew. And here it's in Matthew 13, 33. Another, spare, another parable spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened strange right what what's this all about well as i said before we've got a teaching that i did with ivan and we were going through this from things he had discovered with leaven and you realize well wait a second we're always told in the church that you know little leaven leavens the whole thing and it, it's always related to sin but there's also the good aspect of it and this conversation is the good aspect of it but what we never talked about before was why the three measures? That's what caught me off guard today. I mean, uh, when I when I saw this in relation to following the story from the parable of the mustard seed. You see, because they're connected together in this typology of the story. But this one's for the kingdom of heaven, and the one in Luke is related to the kingdom of God. So I'll show it to you here in Luke. It's in Luke 13, 21. It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. I found it very interesting. Why three measures? So what do we do here in this ministry? We go look for deeper understanding by using what? This is why we use KJV+. This program I'm using for anybody that's interested is called eSword. It might be free depending on what what you use for, for your device, uh, or it might be 5 or $9 a year. Okay, so nothing crazy. I recommend everybody use a program where you can have the Strong's Concordance at your fingertips. It is the entirety of, of opening your understanding that you will understand that, for example, the word woman. You know, you might see it in five different places. It could be five different names. One could be like a bride, right? One could be like a like the, a wife. Another one could be a whore, an adulterer, could, all sorts of things. It's important to understand the context of the conversation. And so that's what I did here. I'm thinking three measures? What's the point of three measures? It's only used twice. And you guys know, 
when something is used a short amount of time, there a, a, a small amount of time, there, there's something going on. And it wasn't just that it was measures. It was the fact that there were three. But you're not going to get anything from three because three is just relating to the number. But the word measures, ah, now you might get somewhere <clears throat> because we see it has a Hebrew origin. And in this Hebrew origin is where things start to get wild. So we go into the Hebrew origin. It's used nine times, and it means for grain measure. And I thought, <laughs> my first thought was, mm, that's not very helpful. Let's see where the story leads us if we dig into the definitions. And this is why uh, this program, blueletterbible.org, you don't have to pay anything for it, um, but you, uh, you can always support them, I'm sure, somewhere. They got donate up there. Um, is let's see if it gives us more info. <clears throat> and like I said, it's only used twice. So this doesn't help. I already know where it's used twice. I already know the conversations taking place with one being for the kingdom of God and one being for the kingdom of heaven. Which means what? One related to the house of Israel, right? With the Gentiles grafted in. And the other one being the house of Judah. So you got the Gentiles, you got the Jews, you got those that are part of the kingdom of God, you got those that are part of the kingdom of heaven. So something relating to these two portions that has three measures. What would be the point of having three measures? Wait a second. We spoke about something like that already, right? Kind of like pre, mid, and post. Kind of like within each, there we've got wheat and we've got grapes. And within them, there's a pre, mid, and post. Who what what are who who or what are these pre, mid, and post? What what are the pre, mid, and post? Well, let me show you something. This is just a, a little reminder. We touched on this briefly a moment ago, right? The first group that's going pre-trib, what are they? They're in Christ, but they walk after the Spirit. They're Spirit-filled. They're Spirit-filled. Do you guys remember that? Uh, the the da, da, da. Yeah, I guess we got it in the fractal too. But if you remember what it relates to, we have the first portion connected to the Holy Spirit, we got the second portion connected to the Son and the third portion connected to the Father. Luke, Mark, Matthew. Spirit filled in Christ, the portion of light and the portion of flesh. The, the gap theory of creation, those in the Spirit, right? Yes, we're all living in Matthew's 6,000 to the 7,000 years of flesh. But within it, there are people that are destined for light. There are those destined or, or for, for the spirit. But we're all living in flesh. So you can be spirit, light, and living in the flesh. But this group would be light living in the flesh. And this, part, this group would be flesh. Who are the ones who get the millennial reign? Which is what? Which is their kingdom of heaven. Jews do. The Jews get their promised heaven on earth. The flesh, the spirit group, and the light group, Jesus said, I came not but for the house, right? But for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he came to shed his light, to shine his light. The spirit group is the group that won't taste any of tribulation, as we showed. But there will be a remnant chosen from among them who Christ will give his light to and they will serve as Christ did, putting their necks on the line to shine the light of the Lord on the group that is destined or, or going to receive the light of the Lord in the great multitude rapture, in the revival of the end of days, 
during seals, which is the Mark group. So you've got a portion to the Spirit, a portion of the Son, a portion of the Father. Now, is the Son in all of it? Yes. Is the Father in all of it? Yes. Is the Spirit in all of it? Yes. But there are those that belong to the Spirit, those that are belonging to the light, and those that belong to the flesh. Are you tracking? Because we got three measures. We got three measures for the kingdom of God, and we got three measures for the kingdom of heaven. So as I scrolled through, I noticed something. I said, wait a second. Genesis 18. <coughs> excuse me. I thought, what does Genesis 18 have to do with any of this? Because I'm looking at the Greek. Why are you showing me Hebrew connections? Well, we've been through this before, haven't we? So I go to Genesis chapter 18. This is pretty wild. Remember what happened. Remember what it is we're talking about. In Luke and in Matthew, we are talking about this strange, I'll call it strange thing, in relation to, where did it go? Right here. In relation to, oh, it switched colors on me. In relation to three measures. If you've ever read this before, I mean, I've read it many times and it never, it never dawned on me. I just, you know, you just, unless the spirit catches you, you just kind of read through, right? You're, you may be looking to other things or you're trying to follow the rest of the storyline. But when you're pausing like this and you're looking through what's before and what's after, these things start to catch your attention. And I thought, three measures. Why would there be three measures? Hold on. Let me set it up for you a little bit more. Do you remember this? Something we've shared on many times. Remember Luke, uh, um, in the Gospels, Jesus says, you know, um, um, that, you know, uh, something about the Father compared to the Son. And there, there seems to be this confusion. And he says, well, didn't David say the father said, the Lord said unto my Lord? And we've explained this, right? In Psalms 110, in verse 1, the Lord, all uppercase, is the Father God, said unto my Lord. So David is saying, the Father God said unto my Lord, who is Jesus, Sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Is Jesus going to be sitting on the right hand of himself? No. We've explained so many, not so many, every person that we've ever shared and, and even read or, or watched on that have ever had an experience in heaven, having died, showed and explained that they, they saw the Father, but it was just this light. They knew it was the presence of the Father. And Jesus was there with them, and they could see the face of Jesus, and they describe him, and people could paint him and draw him. And... You see? Because you got the Father there, and you got the Son. Well, there's also the Spirit, and the Spirit is the one rarely spoken about as having been seen. But there are three. We showed this even in the story in Genesis chapter 1. Are they in perfect harmony? Yes. You guys have all seen that triangle, right? There's the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and all three of them equal God. Right? It, it, but there are three beings. It says in the beginning. The word beginning is Jesus. He is the beginning and the end. So in Jesus, God, the Father, created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Son, Father, Spirit, right there in the beginning of all creation. In Psalms 110, we, of course, had what we just saw, which was the Father said unto Jesus God, the Son. Not, not hard to, to misunderstand. And we've shared on it a number of times. Well, get ready. 
because this gets wild. Genesis 18, 1. The Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, Mamre, and he sat in the tent of the door in the heat of the day. What? The Lord appeared unto him. It's talk, It's about Abraham. We'll see that later. Who appeared unto him? The Lord. The Father God appeared unto Abraham, and he sat in the tent of the door in the heat of the day. And he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men. Wait a second. Three men stood and appeared unto Abraham. So three men appeared unto Abraham as he stood in the door in the heat of the day, and he looks up, and there's three men, for which the first one we were told was the Lord, the Father. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. If you read the story, none of them say, don't do that. Rise up. Remember what happened in Revelation chapter 18? In Revelation chapter 18, when John bows down in verse 10 to the, the angel of the Lord or, or the one who's showing him these things, right? It says, uh, da, 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 and I fell at his feet to worship him and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. He told them not to do it. Here there are three men for which we're told the Lord Father is one of them. And he bows down toward the ground. None of them say, don't do that. And said, my Lord. Wait, what? The Lord. Think of Psalms 110. The Lord said unto my Lord. You see the picture? The Lord said unto my Lord. The Lord Father appears unto him as one of these three men. He bows himself at these three men and then says, my Lord, to which one? To Jesus. One of the three who isn't the Father, it's the Son. If now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, uh, let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort you your hearts. After that, you shall pass on. For therefore are you come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make cakes upon the hearth. So they make all these things. They set it before, um, verse 8. Listen to what comes. Listen to what comes. Hold on, hold on. Let me see. I'm not jumping over things. He says, they, they, they. <clears throat> um, they, they, they. I don't want to take too much longer. Oh, let's just go to verse 9. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. Wait a second. Who does this have to be? Saying that I'm going to come back to you and she's going to be pregnant when I come back at the time that's appointed. Clearly, this is the Lord. All three of them. Lord, Father, Son, and... Well, there's only one left. You'll see in a moment. 
And he said, Certainly I will return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind, and sees Terah after a manner of woman, because she was old, right? Um, therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord? Did you catch it? The Lord said unto my Lord, all uppercase, only uppercase L. And what's the final one? In verse 12, Sarah laughed within herself. Well, and the spirit also dwells within, right? Sarah laughed within herself, saying, after I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord? Lowercase. Lowercase. One who is the, the controller, right? Like the Holy Ghost. Look at the other one. There, there's the Lord who is Christ, who is the Lord. The proper name of God, Jesus God. And then you've got the Lord, God the Father, who is the self-existent, eternal God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. He made three cakes for who? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit of three measures of fine meal. Go read the rest of the story yourselves. I don't want to take, I don't want it to be too, too long. There's essentially, though, you guys have gotten it. You have seen what has happened, what the conversation is, and it was the conversation of the Father the Son, and the Holy Ghost who appeared to Abraham as three men. And people say, well, if anybody looks at God the Father, they die. I'm sure they do. Maybe not as a man. I didn't write this. I didn't make them all uppercase and put the name. I didn't make the L uppercase and put the name. I didn't write it where all of them would be lowercase and put the definition. It's the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost that Abraham had made three measures of fine meal for. So what do you think this is telling us? In relation to Luke's portion and Matthew's portion, when we read... Where are we? In verse 21 of Luke 13, it is like leaven. What kind of leaven is this, guys? Remember, this is the good leaven. He has taken leaven, okay? It is like leaven which a woman took and hid in. And, and what did she do? She hid it. She concealed it. See, this word hid, how many times does it show up in Scripture? The word hid is more than twice. But this one has to do with concealing it in three different measures of meal so that the whole lump will be leavened. A portion for the Spirit, a portion for the Son, a portion for the Father. Right? Those that are Spirit-filled, those that will be light-filled, and those that belong to the flesh. Which means there are, there's a portion of all three in the kingdom of God. Which is what? Think of think of the leaven in relation to wheat and, and the, the, the harvest of the, the church, which has a pre, a mid, and a post, so that when it's all done, it has been leavened with the leaven of the Lord with truth, in the pre, mid, and post. A portion belonging to the Spirit, a portion belonging to the Son, and a portion belonging to the Father. And guess what? What happens when we go to Matthew? Matthew has a portion which relates to Judah or to the Jews. And what would they have? That would mean they have a portion that belongs to the Spirit, that belongs to the Son, 
and that belongs to the Father. Remember, there will be Jews, and there are Jews, who believe in Christ right now as their Lord and Savior and diligently seek and search him out and follow him. There will be some at the mid-trib, which we have proven with the house of Judah, and there will be some post-trib. Three portions to the two portions of the world and the Jews, to the Son, uh, to the Spirit, to the Son, and to the Father. The three portions are the Spirit, the light, and the flesh. That's awesome. That is awesome. That's another mystery. And I'm sure as we continue. And whoever continues and digs into this, you will be able to pull even more out. This started because of the leaven with the revelation and, and, the, and the teaching with Ivan that we did. And knowing parts that we already knew from it. Then taking parts from this and realizing the story of the end of days. Then taking these stories, revealing it in the end of days. <clears throat> and showing that these three portions of meal are directly related to to the portions of the Spirit, the Father, the Son, and the Father. And they're the Spirit of the, the portions of the world and the portions of Judah. You can say like the house of Israel, the Gentiles grafted in, and to the house of Judah. Pre, mid, post, a portion of all three to both times in all three portions of pre, mid, and post. I love it. This is wild. I'm I you can expect now I'm not saying it's going to happen but I'm probably going to be looking <laughs> into more pieces of of the these differences within the gospels of the same stories and I'm going to start looking before and looking after to see what else we're going to find because this isn't the first time that we've done this the it, it, we've done it with other places but never in this in this sense like there We've seen it with the triumphal entry, as I said, the transfiguration, the resurrection. We've done it with them, but it was essentially the same story being laid out going through. This one is completely different stories in each one with something of a similarity in the middle and these clear pre, mid, and post differences before and after laying out the above the seven of seals and the seven of trumpets and that within them there is a portion that belongs to the spirit a portion that belongs to the son and a portion that belongs to the father it is spirit light and flesh awesome brothers and sisters i love you god bless you god bless your families always i pray this blesses you and strengthens you and gives you greater insight and discernment and and understanding seeing through the eyes of the is to come seeing through end time eyes as we like to say love you guys god bless you talk to you soon bye for now